wasn't covered in your textbook were counting permutations when certain things need to be grouped together. Now, technically, you could use the strategies we learned in the textbook, but this is a specific situation that is good to look at and figure out. So the idea is, let's say, all right, let's say, what do you, what do you have a collection of in your room at home? Hmm. Maybe you have collected soccer balls. And you have a lot of soccer balls. And you have white ones and red ones and yellow ones. And they're all different, but you want to display them. I don't know how you display soccer balls. Put a nail through and attach them to the wall. Maybe not the best idea. But you want to display them, but you want to keep the white ones together and the yellow ones together and the red ones together. How many ways could this be done? Well, it becomes a decision question. And your first decision that you have to solve, or the first space, is what order you're going to put the groups. Are you going to put the red ones first, the white ones first, the yellow ones first? And then after you've decided what order you're going to put the groups, then you have decisions on how you're going to arrange the white ones, how you're going to arrange the red ones. So the first example that I have here is pretending that I have different map books. And I would be very clear to tell you that they're different because the number one mistake that is made with grouping questions is thinking a grouping question is an identical objects question. So you have to make a decision, is this question an identical object question, or is this question a grouping question? In this one, it says, I want to keep the subject areas together. I want to group them together, making this a grouping question. So our first decision is, we need to arrange the groups. Am I going to put my calculus books first, or the geometry books? For the algebra books, well, now I have three groups, so this will be three factorial. Once you've decided on the order of your groups, you still have decisions to make in each group. How am I going to arrange my calculus books? I'm going to be under here for calculus. I have four calculus books. You could have done four spaces for four calculus books, but I think we can do that all together now and just say, that would be four factorial. If I wanted to arrange the five algebra books, that would be five factorial. And finally, the four geometry books would be four factorial. And since each of these was a decision, they all get multiplied together. So in a grouping question, you first arrange the groups, and then you arrange in each of the groups, multiply your answer together to count the total. So in our first example, we have five people, Amy, Bill, Jill, Lee, and Tom, are going to sit on a park bench. And how many ways can they be seated if, aw, Jill and Bill want to sit together? So this is a grouping question, because you have Jill and Bill having to be together, and then there's still Amy, Lee, and Tom. In a grouping question, the first thing we do is count how many groups there are. And this is sometimes can be tricky, because I often see students say, hey, there's two groups here. There's Jill and Bill and the other three. But do the other three have to sit together? No. Does it make sense that Jill and Bill could sit together in the middle and Amy and Tom and Lee could be on the outside? That's perfectly fine. So we think of there's actually four groups. Jill and Bill is one group, but then Amy, Lee, and Tom are all individuals and separate as their own group. Sometimes I teach this question and instead of saying four groups, I rephrase this and say, there are now four people. There is Amy Lee Tom, and since they're never apart, 
the Jill Bill. You might have sometimes people in high school that start dating and they're like, you never ever see them anywhere apart. So you just start referring to them by one name. It's like they are now called the Jill Bill because they are always together. So then you would have four people that you're rearranging on the park bench. And that would be four factorial. Then you look in your groups. Right? You could draw four spaces for the four groups. I'm just going to draw one space because the Jill Bill could either be the Jill Bill or the Bill Jill. And so there would be two factorial ways. They could hold left hand, right hand, or right hand, left hand. They could be in two different ways seated on this part. Then. You could draw space for Amy and do one factorial, one factorial for Lee, one factorial for Tom. But that's just multiplied by 1, so it's not necessary. And if we multiply these together, 24 times 2 gives us 48 baby souls. All right. Well, I guess the Jill Bill is a little contagious because in example 2, now Lee and Amy also have to sit together. Poor Tom. Don't worry. Tom gets his revenge in part two. Uh oh. <laughs> so now we have the Jill Bill. Lee and Amy, which still go by Lee and Amy because they're not like a Jill Bill. They're like sometimes they have their own friends and, and whatnot. And poor Tom. Now your number of groups is 3, so that would be 3 factorial. Your Jill Bill is still 2 factorial. Your Lee and Amy, 2 factorial. And you could add a 1 for Tom if you wanted, but not necessary. We multiply this out 6 times 2 times 2, 24 ways. Now, I'm a little surprised that these five friends still decide to go sit on this park bench because something definitely happened. And now, uh oh. Now, Jill and Bill must not sit together. We won't say what Tom's revenge was. We'll leave that up to your English class imagination. Um, but yes. Jill and Bill must not sit together. Lee and Amy, they're fine to sit together. They're fine not to sit together. We're not worried about this. We just want to count the total ways that the five people can go and sit on the bench, but Jill and Bill are not together. And this is a great example of where the not strategy, which we saw before, is really useful. The not strategy says if you want to count something, Sometimes it's easier to count all the ways and subtract the bad ones. Now, how many ways can all five of them go and sit on that park bench? Five factorial. 120 ways, all five of them. And that would include the ways where Jill and Bill are together, and it would include the ways that they're apart. Now, in part A, we counted that there was 48 ways that they sit together. Does it make sense that if you take 48 away from the total, all that would be left, 120 minus 48, is the number of ways they would be apart. Still surprises me, though, that if something of the magnitude of your imagination happened, that they would still go and sit on the park bench, all five of them. Makes for good math questions. And our last permutations topic that we're going to look at is permutations with cases. Sometimes you can't count things directly, okay, or not easily directly, and you have to break them up. For example, the question we just did. Another way that you could solve this 
would be to break this up and think about it with spaces and go, well, I guess one possibility is Jill could sit here, but then this can't be Bill, and then it wouldn't matter after that. If I counted that, this would be one way, right? How many people can sit here? Well, there's four people left, but it can't be built, so only three ways. Then three, then two, then one, giving me 18 ways. But is that the only possibility? No. This is why the not strategy is better. You could have put Jill here. But then this can't be built, and this can't be built. One way for Jill there. Three people can sit there, two people can sit there, and then there's two left and one, and if I multiply that together, I get 12 left. Then, Jill here. Then Jill here, then Jill there. And if you did all five of those different cases and added them up, I hope you can see that this middle one is 12, the next one will be 12, and on the end will be symmetrical to that one, 18. 36 plus 36 is 72 when I add them up. And we could have done this with cases, but the not strategy was a lot easier. But there will be some times that cases will be necessary, where you count things separately, think about all the situations that could happen, count them separately, and then add them up in total. And that's called permutations with cases. So here, how many numbers of at most three different digits, so we're not allowed repetition, can be formed with 0 to 9? Well, when it has this at most, you could have three digit numbers, two digit numbers, and one digit number. They would have to be counted separately. So the way that we set up a cases question is we do a little explanation of what our case one will be, and we'll call it a three-digit number. And a three-digit number, there's a restriction. Because your first digit can't be a zero. Otherwise, it's not a three-digit number. So then there's only nine choices there. For your second digit, You've used up one number, but zero gets put back in. Still nine choices. And now you've used up two numbers, eight choices left. For 648. Case two. A two digit number. Again, same restriction. Can't be zero. Nine choices, then nine. It's 81. And finally, case three. A one digit number. Can you have, is zero a one digit number? Yeah. Yes. So then you can have all 10 choices. Really tough math. That's equal to 10. And add them up. So from the numbers from 0 to 999, 739 of them have all different digits. The other ones would have some repetition. 88 has two ones. 121 has two ones. That'd be a good question. You have the numbers from 0 to 999. In a bag, you pull one out. What are the chances you get a number with all three digits different? 739 out of that. 72.9%. A very typical cases question involves restrictions where there's more than one restriction and the same restriction appears in two places. So we're using the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5. And the question is, how many three-digit numbers 
can be formed using those digits that are greater than 300 and even. And we'll start by trying, and don't write this down, but we're going to start by trying to do it all at once. We're going to draw our space and say I have three decisions. And I know with restrictions, I deal with my restrictions first. So there's a restriction that I have to end with either a two or a four to make it even. And I have to start with either a three, a four, or a five to make it bigger than 345. And we've already learned that if you have a restriction, you have to deal with the restriction first. But now it's like, well, what if I have two restrictions? I just pick one of them to deal with first? OK. Let's say I pick this one, I deal with this one first, I say I have three choices. This is where we run into a problem, because we don't know what number to write in here. Why can't I write two? Well, I might have used up the four. Can you see in those three choices, you might have picked the four. If you pick the four, then I have to write a one here. But you might have picked the three. Then I have to write a two there. And so we run into a problem that we don't know what number because we have this overlap of a restriction. The four can come in one of two places. So the solution, well, break something up. Count it separately. Choose either of the restrictions. It really doesn't matter. Let's say case one, that four is a problem. I'm going to end with four. I break up the restriction on the end, and I say it's going to have to be a four, one choice. Now, my first restriction, what are my choices here? Well, since I've used up the four, does it make sense that I have to either start with a three or a five to be greater than 300? I only have two choices there. I've now used up two numbers. There would be three numbers left that could go there, no restrictions whatsoever, so I can just write three choices there. Gives me six in total. Then I have to ask myself, well, what haven't I counted? I haven't counted ending with a two. That would be one choice there. Then there would be three possibilities for the first number, because it could be three, four, or five, three choices. You've used up two numbers, no restrictions on the middle, three choices. Gives you nine for case two. Add up your cases, and you have 15 in total. And how you break up your cases is up to you. If you wanted to take the first restriction, and say, I'm going to start with a 3, case 1. Start with a 4, case 2. Start with a 5, case 3. And add those up. It'll work out the same. But you just have to have some sort of explanation of what your different cases are. And also, very typical with cases questions are these questions that say, if you use the numbers, we're still using the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, how many numbers are bigger than 232? If you tried to do this directly, can you see that there's a restriction on the first digit? The first digit, what are the possibilities? Could it be a 1? No. No. Could it be a 2? Yes. Yes. It could be a 2, it could be a 3, it could be a 4, it could be a 5. You have four choices that could work. But what's the problem if I start with this with four choices? I don't know what number to put next. Why don't I know what number to put next? Well, if I chose the 3, no problem. I could put any number next. But if I chose the 2, I can't put a 1 next. I have a problem. So when you run into this issue where you're trying to do it directly and something doesn't work, which is very typical when they say how many numbers are greater than this, then you have to go to cases. And with greater than questions, I always like to start off with case one to say, what could I do to guarantee that it's bigger? 
Well, if I start with a 3, a 4, or a 5, in other words, this first digit's a 3, a 4, or a 5, that will count all the numbers in the 300s, the 400s, and the 500s. Can you see that that's guaranteed to be bigger than 232? Once I choose one of those numbers, three choices there, once I choose one of those numbers, there is no restrictions on what comes next. I've used up one number. How many numbers are left? Four numbers are left. I've used up two numbers. There would be three numbers left. This gives me 36 numbers. Then I have to ask, what well, haven't I counted? Case two. Well, now I can start with a two. Then will there be a restriction on the second digit? Yes. What would guarantee that it would be bigger? Can you see if you made a four or a five? Guaranteed you'd be bigger. Because that would count the 240 or the 250s. So my first space, now I'm saying this has to be a two, one choice. Second space is a four or a five, two choices. Then my third space would have no restrictions, but I've used up two numbers, so I would have three choices left, giving me six in total. Case three, you have to ask yourself, is there anything left that I haven't counted? Yeah, there would be some numbers in the 230s that would be bigger than 232. So I'm going to start with a 2. Then a 3. This is a 2. One choice. This is a 3. One choice. Do you have any restrictions on this last digit? Yes. Okay. Imagine here's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, but you've used up the 2 and the 3. Does it make sense that the only option for the last one have to be four or five. Two choices. Add them all up, and there would be 44 numbers greater than 232. So this is a very typical cases question, where for the two most common cases question, one, more than one restriction, and the restrictions overlap. Two, picking a number greater than something. So you have to break it up and count what would guarantee that it's bigger first, then what haven't you counted, and would guarantee it's bigger, then what haven't you counted, and would guarantee that it's bigger. And with cases questions, you always add them up in total. So uh, even on permutations one, which you started working yesterday, there was one question that was cases. There was the one where it said the female's president, male secretary. The next one, the male's president, female secretary. What if they have to be opposite sex? Well, then you would just take case one and case two and add them together for that third one. Uh, what we're going to do today is we're going to work on those questions.